It's only but a foretaste of spiritual death. The horrors and the terrors of spiritual death. Physical death only is but crumbs. And it's ugly. It's stinky. It's not to be desired. And yet, we don't realize that there is a much greater death. And that death is not physical, but it's spiritual. And it's lost on us. We come to church and we shout and we play. We play the tambourine, we sing in the choir. And as the Bible says, we are, many are, dead in their trespasses and sins. And that has no import to us because we don't know what death really looks like. And we're dead in our trespasses and sin. There is a death far worse than physical death. I'm coming to a close. I don't mean to bore you, but... This is what the Lord gave me. There is something far worse. Kevin is right here today. Our brothers, we mourn his passing. Kevin is right here today. And there's something far worse than dying at a young age. Died only 48 years old, right behind me, going to turn 49 this year. But there's something far worse than dying at a young age. The worst thing could be that a person lived for not 48 years, but 108 years and die and go to a devil's hell. The scriptures say that it is appointed unto man. Every man wants to die. But after this, the judgment, the tyranny of death, the tyranny that's found in death. The tyranny is that we cannot escape it. No one gets out of here unscathed, lest the Lord crack the sky. No one gets out of here any other way except one dies. Everybody dies. One for one. Everybody dies. And, and why does death afflict us, bro preacher? Why does death affect everybody? What is that? Why is that such a problem for us? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 6, 23, the problem is that for the wages of sin is death. The payment, the remuneration, the honorarium, if you will, for sin is death. Oh, that's a high wall to climb. Absolutely it is. That's difficult, that's hard to conceive, but that's not the worst part of about it. The wages of sin is death. Yeah. Somebody may feel all right, but this is the problem. This is the difficulty. This is where we really find our difficulty. For the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. I, I wish I could say, I wish I could say, for y'all have sinned. But the book says, for all have sinned. So don't, don't try to look down your nose at anybody that may not be on your level or might not move as you move and shout as you shout. Each one of us are sinners saved by grace. I wish I had a helper in here. There is, there is a need for us here again to put amazing back in grace. Thank God for his grace. Put amazing back in grace. Grace is what has brought us and called us and taught us. Thank God for the grace of God. Amen, somebody. Romans 5 and 12 says this, wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have 
sinned. That doesn't escape from anyone. Everybody has sinned. And I want to tell you, and I sound the alarm, and I tell you today, and I sound it because I realize that when, when the trumpet is required, a flute won't do. We didn't come here to play. This is serious business. And I want to tell you this, this afternoon that we are in trouble. We're in trouble. We are in a quandary, quandary of the first degree. We are in a predicament that's without peer. We are in a categorical, universal, unrelenting, unequivocal conundrum that is mammoth. It's colossal. It's without escape. No liberation. No deliverance. Our situation, brothers and sisters, is so dire and serious that there is no answer. Except there is. Yes, sir. I, I want to read this text for us and I'm finishing now. If anyone's getting afraid, I'm finishing now. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, says it on this wise. We'll read several verses. This is important. For both, this is what it says, Hebrews 11, 2 and 11. For both he that sanctifies, speaking of Jesus, he that is holy, and they who are sanctified, or they, those who are made holy, are all of one. Now, I, I, now, if I were a able preacher, I could preach from that by itself for six months. Did you, I don't think you heard what I said. For both he that sanctifies, he that is already holy, that's Jesus, and he that, that uh, uh, sanctifies and, is, and those who are being sanctified, those who are being made ho ho holy, are all one. That is amazing. That is amazing. Jesus and me, one. Now let me go further, but it says, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now I got some kinfolk that don't claim me, amen. But Jesus the Christ, he stands and calls me brother. Thank you, Lord. I wish I had time to preach that because that, that will preach for six months by itself right there. Verse 12 says, saying, I will declare thy name. Listen, he's saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church or in the midst of the sanctuary will I sing praises unto thee. Jesus is saying, I'm going to also sing of you and, and, and actually glorify you in the midst of other brethren. He's going to brag on us. He's going to sing about us. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting happy by myself. But, but, but verse 13 says, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children with, which God hath given me. Uh, Pastor Jermaine said it a moment ago, if you're saved, thank God, thank God you're saved. But you didn't choose God, God chose you. He's never lost. You were the, we were the one that were lost. And so it says right here in the text again, and it affirms it again. He says, God hath given me. Verse 14 says, and I'm finishing, for as much then, here it is, as the children are partakers. As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, saying that since, since we are humans, Christ became human alluding to Philippians chapter 2 and you know what it says there that, that he, came, he took on the form of a, of a man and became a servant here it is that's what he said since they were human I became human and he says here that through listen this is it this is it this is it this is here right here bro Corey that through death he might destroy him that had the power over death that is the devil. Verse 15 says, and I'm, this is the last verse, and deliver them 
who through fear of death, been, we've been uh, terrorized and horrified by death for six millennia. And he says that now he delivers us through the fear, the, through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage and now Christ has made us free. I said Christ has made us free. That ought to make somebody happy. I'm not talking about a diamond ring, not talking about a fur coat, but somebody ought to be glad that Jesus has set me free. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I ought to have a witness in here. But he says, he tells us right there, and in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, I'm almost finished. Y'all sit down just for a minute. I'm almost finished. Y'all come on, stand with me in just a minute. I'm going to tell you when, but come on. Uh, I'm almost finished. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says this. For this purpose was the Son of God made manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And his primary work was the tyranny of death. For millennia we've been afraid of death. But thank God he set us free. Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. His salvific, substitutionary, atoning, uh, vicarious work on the cross. Oh, we've got something to praise God for. That Kevin received by faith. He is now shielded and protected and set free from the righteous wrath and the holy judgment of God. Let me just interject just as a side note that do you not know that when we are saved, you are not saved necessarily from sin only. You're not saved only from hell. Ultimately, do you know what you're saved from? You're saved from God. God is the one that's going to mete out judgment in hell, not the devil. We're saved from God, from his wrath, from his judgment, that in which we deserve and that which we think we don't desire, but if we desire it because we go for it all the time. We're saved, somebody say, from God. Say, from God, by God, unto God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. I can't hear nobody. I said hallelujah. Who can save you from God? If you're in the place and in the line of God's target, who can save you from God? I don't care how many lines you get. I don't care how greasy and oily you get. I don't care who prays for you. If, if God wants you and God got it out for you, brother and sister, nobody can save you from God except God. That's why we thank him for Jesus. Can't nobody save you but God. And we're saved from God. Thank you, Lord. One more time. Y'all sit down. I'm, I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. Somebody say hallelujah. 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 Kevin, 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 he's dead physically to never return back to us. But he's, hallelujah, he's alive spiritually. And since he can't come to us, I'll go to him. Do I have a witness here? I'm going to tell you just something testimonial right quickly. I'm just parenthetically saying this. I know, I know, I'm confident, Brother Stan, I'm confident that Kevin is saved. Just a few years ago, six, seven, eight years ago, thereabouts, he rededicated his life to God and his life, he's always been a good guy, but I want you to know goodness ain't gonna get you there. Just as a testimony, just as a testimony. I, I never, I, I've never heard my brother curse. Never. I'm, I'm 50 years old, I've known him all his life. Never heard him curse. Never seen him pick up a cigarette. Never seen him drink, drink an alcohol beverage. All oh, that's good, but your goodness ain't good enough. He need Jesus. 
and he changed his life and rededicated his life to the Lord. And he told me, he said, big brother, and we used to sometimes argue vociferously. I mean, just over and over and over again about some things. And, and, and he's my little brother trying to tell me what to do in my business too. Amen, somebody. I'm your big brother, but he was trying to tell me what to do. And, and, and we would argue sometimes, but he said, man, I want you to know, Steve, you my pastor. And I want you to rebaptize me. He says, I've rededicated my life to the Lord and I'm living for Jesus. And I'm so glad he told me that. And as his pastor, I'm, I, I want to just finish this message on his behalf because he is dead physically uh, to never return to us. But he's alive spiritually. And since we can't, he can't come to us, we can go to him. Now, I, I want you to understand, I'm not senile. I'm finishing now. I announced my text. I announced my subject, rather. I didn't have a text, per se. I announced my subject, and the subject is at death's door. I hadn't forgotten. Listen, Greg. Listen, Darren. Listen, everybody. We must not miss the profundity of this moment. You're at death's door. You're at death's door. Everybody here is sick enough to live and well enough to die. The profundity of this moment is Kevin was a health buff. He was strong. Strapping, a virile man, the epitome of, of manhood, if you will. He was a quintessential masculine man, and he's gone, gone, 48 years old, gone. He's gone, just like that, he's gone. God is so good. He's so merciful. He's so kind. Because God never sends destruction without first sending warning. Somebody needs to hear this. The scripture says, being often reproved, he that being often reproved and yet hardeneth his neck shall be suddenly cut down. And that without remedy. Some of us know what we need to do, and we haven't done it. I want to tell you, brothers, and I want to tell you, sisters, I want to tell you that even if your doctor was to be able to examine you right now, I'm closing, if he, if he was to be able to look at your lungs and your heart and your pressure, if he was to be able to examine your diet and your exercise, and you'd ask the doc, hey, doc, what's my prognosis? If he were to be completely frank, if he were to be completely direct, he would tell you these words, still terminal. I don't care how healthy you are, how many pills you take, how much sleep you get at night, how good your diet is. They may tell you that you got a clean bill of health, still terminal. You're going to die. You, you, you're going to, regardless of the doctor's pronouncement, your condition is terminal. Now, I know this may not feel good to somebody, but I need you to do this with me. I want you to say to yourself, and I'm not saying right now, but I want you to tap yourself on, this, on your chest and say, I'm dying. I don't see everybody doing it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm, I'm dying. If you don't believe it, just go back home to some of the Central High School people that are here. Go back home and look in your yearbook and see what you looked like 30 years ago. That picture will tell you, you, you yeah, you dying. You, you closer to death than you think you will. I'm dying. You're Hear me, saints, brothers, 
sisters, beloved, you're at death's door right now. Central High School, I'm referring to that again. We can attest to to this reality. Four deaths over the past seven days. Four deaths. We're dying. We need to live life with eternity in view. Some people think that may be morbid, but it'll help you to live a stricter life. It will make your eye a little bit more jealous, a little bit more clear. You won't be concerned with everything when you recognize the fact, I'm fixing to get out of here. Amen. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Brother and sister, and the problem is some of us are losing our soul and we losing our soul with no money, bad credit, cheap alcohol, and sorry dope. Come on here, somebody. The cheap stuff I'm talking about. And the Bible says if you gain the whole world, it profits you nothing if you lose your soul. What can a man exchange for his soul? Nothing. Nothing. I'm finished. Central warriors, those of us who were fortunate to grow up together, I want to thank you. But I want to tell you that we are trapped in a very difficult trap. Everybody else that's here as well. We grew up, many of us, with a mindset. We knew, even when we, went to, we were in junior high school, we knew we were going to college. We just knew it. Whether we finished it or not, that was, up, you know, that was something else. <laughs> but we just knew off the top, we're going to college. and we, we didn't even think about that. When we graduated, we knew that we were going somewhere. We were trying to do something. And we had comrades who went to Harvard and Yale and Morehouse and all of these different places, UT Knoxville and just different places everywhere. And sometimes we have gotten sidelined sometimes going for success. What does it mean to climb the ladder of success? Stepping on folk, pushing folk down, and missing your ethics and your morals, relinquishing all of that, and get to the top of the ladder and realize, only then to realize that your ladder was leaned against the wrong wall. This is the day. Kevin is speaking loud and clear. And the Holy Spirit is speaking in someone's heart even now. Yes, he is. I want you to do something for me. If you would just grab somebody's hand that you're sitting nearest. Just grab that hand. Grab that hand. They're not going to hurt you. They're not going to bite you. But grab that hand. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Father. How I thank you for this inconveniencing truth that was not displayed or that was not delivered in a classical sense. But God, I believe somebody has heard your word. God, I I ask now, Lord, that for those who are in the valley of decision, that you call them to you right now as only you can call them unto you those of us that need to rededicate our lives God we ask now that you would now strengthen us that we might live more for you this is not a myth this is not a story this is not a playtime or a plaything but God this is real So God, I ask now, help my neighbor. If it's them, Lord, 
touch them and talk to them speak to them Holy Spirit call them unto you even right now but God if it's me help me to have the courage to surrender and answer and say again Lord not my will but thine be done thank you thank you for your mercy thank you for your grace you're so good to us and we thank you now for we can't even go to hell without climbing over sermons and climbing over prayers and climbing over testimonies oh god we we we, we can't go to hell god with without having to, to to make ourselves go so god help us to come to our mind right now come to our senses right now and call upon your holy enduring name in the name of Jesus I thank you I thank you I thank you amen let me say in, in closing I believe the reason that Kevin may have gone on God has a way of speaking he'll take one to get the attention of ten He'll take one that's ready to get the attention of 10 who are, who are not. And with that in mind, we give God praise. We thank God for our brother. You can't crown him until I get there. Listen, I've been pastoring one church 33 years. I've been to a whole lot of funerals. I've heard a whole lot of eulogies. That was one of the most profound sermons I've heard in a long. Now, you may didn't get it, but I got it. That was what a word. What a Herculean job. What a way to send your brother home. Come on, let's thank God for the ministry of Pastor Stephen Young, would you? Great word. Hallelujah. What a word, what a word, what a mighty, mighty word. The internment is going to be, the entombment rather, will be at Memorial Park. Cemetery, 5668 Poplar Avenue.